you all, I sent you all an email saying that um, Jason was going to join us. He has a, um, a BA in Environmental Studies at UC Santa Barbara and a Master's of Public Administration at SDSU. He's been in um, city, working in, with cities for a long time. He was uh, the assistant, may, uh, assistant to our mayor 2015 to 2019. And now he is the Intergovernmental Affairs Director of the Manager's Office here in Carlsbad. Um, he has said he, he has provided some slides for us. Um, he wanted to get a little bit of a background about the League of Women Voters. So I, I told him who we are and, and that we are nonpartisan and um, that we are interested in educating ourselves. We do advocacy but based only on our positions, which we reach through consensus and study. I also told him that um, to expect some pretty good questions at the end of his at the end of his presentation. So Jason, we know you're a busy man. Thank you again for joining us and welcome to the Carlsbad unit of the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego. It's over to you, Jason. Thank you, Connie. Appreciate that introduction and uh, nice of you all to have me here with you this morning. Um, so yeah, on top of um, uh, kind of what Connie told you about me, I've also, I, I mean, now coming up on, I don't know what it is, maybe 25 years in, in municipal government and working with municipal governments. I started with the city of Santa Barbara um, and also uh, did several years uh, in ski country in Colorado. Uh, including one term as a uh, elected town councilman there. And so I've kind of seen all sides of, of this. I worked in redevelopment with the city of Santa Barbara, uh, which was very involved in, in housing development and affordable housing development in particular there, as well as downtown revitalization. Um, I've been with the city of Carlsbad now since 2015, uh, as Connie mentioned, and um, it's been great. It's been a, a fun roller coaster. We've had a few city managers and and lots of change in the city organization. And um, Carlsbad's just a great city to work for. It's so well run and and well resourced and and just a, a really nice uh, place to be. And and so uh, we're enjoying our time here. Um, so yeah, I, I was asked mainly to talk about housing legislation and kind of the impact on the city. And so I, you know, forgive me if I if I go too simplistic with this or too far back, but I wasn't sure how familiar all of you would be with um, how you know legislation affects housing in Carlsbad and, and all cities across California. So I'm going to do a little bit of a of a background on some of that um, and take you through some recent changes over the last uh, five years or so that are affecting how we look at housing. Um, some ongoing um, work that's being done at the city to kind of map out um, housing development, you know, for the future um, in the city, and then talk specifically about a couple laws that were passed last year in the legislative session um, that really changed some some fundamental dynamics related to single family uh, residential zoning and, and what the future of that looks like. Um, We'll touch a little bit about on the current session and um, open it up for questions. So if now is a good time, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I do have a presentation for you all. Let's see. Is that coming up for everybody? Okay. I'm just gonna move that over so I can see and make sure I can advance my slides. Okay, that's going. Okay. So, um, you know, to go way back, since 1969, cities in California are required to plan to meet the housing needs of their community. And, um, you know, not only does that account for the numbers of, of people that are um, currently in your city or projected to be in your city, but it also um, relates to different affordability levels. Uh, so it factors in income uh, levels and and require cities to uh, plan for housing to meet and be affordable to, to people at various income levels. In terms of the process, um, 
you've probably heard of it as the regional housing needs assessment or regional housing needs allocation. It's the RENA process. Um, essentially, you have a state agency that uh, generates an initial forecast. Uh, they assign a regional allocation through our um, SANDAG, which is our regional planning organization. And then through that organization, you come up with um, more jurisdictional local allocations of housing units that need to be accommodated in, in each of the cities that, that uh, comprise SANDAG. And, and those are expressed then through local general plan housing elements that describe how you're going to accommodate those um, and it's really just a plan to accommodate those. So we need to create the environment through our planning documents, policies, and otherwise that um, would allow us to accommodate the number of units that are assigned to the city, uh, both in terms of how many units and their affordability levels. So we're currently in the sixth cycle of RENA, um, and that covers the time span of 21 to 29, 2021 to 2029. Um, and for Carl's, and if you think in eight year increments going back to 69, you see how we get to the sixth cycle. Um, and so for this cycle, we've been assigned uh, just under, I think, 3,900 new units to accommodate here in Carlsbad and, and about 2,100 of those need to be affordable to very low to moderate um, income levels. And so just, you know, a simple way to think about that is that, you know, Carlsbad oftentimes in planning terms is thought about in quadrants. Um, kind of with the X at, you know, Palomar Airport Road and um, El Camino Real. And so if you think of each of those quadrants, you know, looking roughly at 4,000 units, we need to think about accommodating 1,000 new units uh, in each of those more or less over the next um, seven years now, I guess. And so the way we do that again is through our general plan and our housing element and so the city council has been going through a process over the last uh, year year and a half to update that uh, in terms of our uh, housing plan and in fact this week at the council meeting they just reviewed um, a map to address one of the specific strategies around doing that you know you can um, identify new sites where housing can go you can talk about um, you know, one of the one of the main ways strategies that we're going to accommodate those new units is to talk about zoning and how we plan for density and affordability and and really affordability in terms of housing policy is expressed through um, your density class classification. So the higher density classification, you assume that it's going to be a more affordable uh, housing product. And so this map, I know it's a little hard to see probably, but um, in pink, you see existing for affordable housing. Uh, in blue, uh, approved but unbuilt affordable housing projects. Red identifies vacant sites that could be, um, uh, could accommodate medium and high density housing. Um, and then green with potential housing sites. And so just to orient very quickly, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up here at the top of the map is um, the shops at Carlsbad. And so there's anticipated to be a significant housing, you know, development on the surface parking lots there. Um, this area here is broken out in the corner. This green is the um, Carlsbad Coaster Station and kind of the downtown village area, recognizing that you again have a large area of surface parking lots that, that could accommodate uh, new housing development. You see our lagoons, one, two, and three. Uh, Palomar Airport Road here with the airport and the industrial area. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of thinking about the nature of different parts of our city, you know, the southeast quadrant, you know, heavily single family residentially zoned and, and developed, um, not a lot of new opportunity for, for new subdivision development. Um, you think about the Ponto area and kind of the southwest down here is being fairly unique. Um, the village obviously occupying the Upper West and then, um, you know, a lot of this open space that, that uh, accounts for a lot of the uh, Northeast segment of the city. So with that, I'll just say this week, the council um, authorized staff to move forward on a couple different map scenarios to go through an environmental review process, uh, which will ultimately 
uh, lead to them adopting a, an updated housing element that, and housing plan that lays out uh, where we are planning to accommodate uh, the affordable housing that we've been assigned. So on top of that kind of context, you know, something that's relatively unique to Carlsbad is that in 1986, um, the city and then voters approved uh, Proposition E, which laid out our growth management plan for the city. And that plan does a couple of unique things. Um, it um, identifies housing caps by quadrant, so it limits the number of units that uh, could be built uh, across the city, uh, anticipating kind of that future growth. Um, they capped it at just under 55,000 new units. Um, it also established performance standards for a variety of different public facilities um, and basically um, put it on the development community as new development comes through. Uh, to pay their way for new development um, as that development comes online. And it relates to a, this list of um, different public facilities. And so we exact those things from developers uh, in terms of making them um, ensure that standards are met across the, their zone or citywide, depending on the particular facility, um, before their development can occur. And so effectively, uh, if you don't have um, achievement of the standard in any of these areas, it effectively put, would put in place a moratorium on development in that area, and you couldn't go forward with a development until uh, we meet the particular performance standards in these various areas. And I won't go through those individually, but I will just point out the bottom three are a, a different color a little bit. Those are thought of more um, citywide in terms of citywide facility services. Uh, and the above um, list is applies more on a zone level. And the city identified uh, 25 different public facility zones that cover uh, across the entire city. So coming into kind of the modern era to some degree in 2017, um, SB 166 was passed and it was a bill presented by um, Senator Skinner um, and it's called the Residential Density and Affordability Act. And, and what it said was that um, throughout the planning uh, period, the arena cycle, that as, as things develop and, and you know where you were planning for a particular density or number of units or affordability level, uh, projects might come through that don't meet those expectations. And so uh, as that occurs, a city can have no net inventory loss in terms of the potential development. So as changes come in, you need to accommodate that in real time with upzoning or downzoning of other parcels throughout the community to accommodate and ensure that you continue to be able to meet those, those levels relative to potential density and affordability and recognizing that there's some market uncertainty in that um, the state agency that oversees this, um, Housing and Community Development, um, recommends and, or requires in terms of approving your plan that you plan a 30% buffer. Um, you build that into your, your numbers. And so uh, we go ahead and do that. And that law uh, has no sunset or expiration uh, associated with that. So that guides a lot of how we ma manage our housing planning in the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in 2019, uh, SB 330 was passed, another bill by Senator Skinner, the Housing Crisis Act. Um, and that did two critical things in terms of our growth management plan. And it really nullified a couple of those tools that I mentioned earlier. One, it said cities cannot impose housing caps in their cities, for one thing. Um, and if you look at the, the new uh, allocations that we've received, it brings us right up to the limit of our growth management plan. And um, going forward, you know, in future cycles, we'll be exceeding that with the new allocation. So that limit on units no longer applies. And you also cannot have any mechanisms in place that would trigger moratoriums on, on housing development. We're really recognizing that, you know, so many things across the state in terms of homelessness and affordability um, you know, legislators are, are viewing that as, you know, kind of a housing deficit. And so 
removing barriers to new housing development is a key strategy for um, helping alleviate some of that. Um, there is a caveat, you know, unless it's determined at a local level that there's an imminent threat to public health or safety, um, you can put some of those things in place to limit housing development, but, um, you know, that's very limited. And so last year, uh, council, city council actually uh, adopted a resolution that acknowledged kind of the, um, that those aspects of our growth management plan are no longer um, valid or enforceable. Uh, that bill was passed originally with the 2025 sunset and last year with the passage of um, SB8 that was you know in our view prematurely but uh, regardless uh, extended to 2030 and so now any uh, housing applications that come in uh, prior to January 2030 um, you know are subject to um, the terms of SB330. Let's see, so taking us to last year, um, there were, the state got really active in the housing space. There were 31 housing bills um, that were passed and hopefully you can see that whole screen. I have kind of our, um, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, there, so there were 31 housing bills adopted last year and then um, an additional 22 billion was included in the state budget uh, to touch on housing affordability and homelessness programs, um, ultimately with the goal of producing um, about 84,000 new affordable units statewide through that funding. I already touched on SB8, which extended the sunset of the Housing Crisis Act. Um, SB9 is one that got, is a bill that got a lot of attention last year. It was um, authored by um, Senate Pro Tem Tony Atkins out of San Diego, um, and it it's fairly impactful, you know, potentially, uh, particularly in Carlsbad. When we think back about the the map that I showed with all of the single family uh, residential zoning, this bill provides that um, any single family residentially zoned prop property um, now. Um, cities would only have ministerial review, which means no discretionary review uh, oversight. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly rubber stamp kind of process of review and approval to allow up to two units of development on any single family property. And, and we already have housing uh, legislation in place that relates to ADUs and, and junior ADUs, which you may have heard of accessory dwelling units. Um, this can be combined with that. So now you can have two units plus an ADU. Um, so you really could be up to three units on a single family zone. It also provides for ministerial review of a residential lot split. Um, and however, when you do employ a lot split, I don't think you're allowed to combine that with ADUs. So theoretically you could take a single family residential zone parcel, split it into and then develop two units on each. And so where you once or currently may have a single family uh, home on a parcel, you could in the future see that developed as um, four new units and two of those parcels could be sold separately. So the city opposed that along with many, many other cities across the state and the League of California Cities. Um, but nonetheless, that was um, signed into law uh, by the governor last year. SB 10 is um, a bill by Scott Weiner that um, the city didn't take a position on necessarily. It's an opt-in bill that allows local governments to pass an ordinance that would allow um, any designated parcel that they want to designate in their ordinance for up to 10, us 10 units of residential density. Um, some cities and some advocates were very concerned about the potential of that bill um, in our view because it's it's an opt-in kind of um, framework we didn't feel it was necessary to, to position on that it did pass um, it's a tool that in the future if if the city wanted to identify parcels in transit rich areas jobs rich areas um, or otherwise an urban infill site um, we could go ahead and, and, and use that so this is the um, advocacy letter that went to um, the governor and it's 
sponsored by the League of California Cities, which is our you know, advocacy group for cities across the state. Um, this is page one. You see all of the seals of the signatory cities that, that signed on to it. Page two, it continues along with a list at the bottom of all of the cities that signed on. That includes Carlsbad, of course, and many of our neighbors. Um, and uh, that's the that's the final tally on it. I don't know how many cities it was. It was well over a hundred, um, a, few, a few hundred cities, I think, that um, signed in opposition. Nonetheless, that passed the legislature and was signed into law. Um, I don't think I'll get into those bills too much. Um, one of the things that we did see in terms of a trend legislatively is that the city, the state wants to have more um, oversight and enforcement and um, tracking of cities in terms of performance uh, towards the goals of your housing element. And so um, there have been a few proposals that um, would put in place mechanisms for the, the state to check in um, and, and have oversight on and possibly impose corrective action if or bring suits against cities um, for not actually making progress against your housing element. Um, AB 500 is a bill by um, Assemblymember Chris Ward out of San Diego that um, attempted to um, initially provide additional oversight over housing to the California Coastal Commission for coastal areas. Um, it's an area that the Coastal Commission did have some purview over, uh, but was legislated out of previously. They're trying to get back into that space. Um, you know, there are some contradictions in terms of the provisions of the Coastal Act and various housing laws that make it difficult to um, achieve kind of what can be disparate goals in those pieces of legislation. Um, and so uh, we that that's coming back. I don't know if it's if it's been um, reintroduced this year as a two year bill, but um, we'll be monitoring that closely. Um, it's certainly a concern for Carlsbad. It, it, it dictates the process by which you review and approve um, housing in the coastal zone at this point. Um, and again, this was a this AB 989 kind of was this um, idea of putting an intermediary government agency in place that would allow folks, uh, developers primarily, that believe that they are, um, that local jurisdictions are applying um, various housing laws inappropriately to appeal that to a department uh, within HCD um, and provide for additional oversight and enforcement against cities where um, impropriety is, is, is uh, alleged. So with that, I'll, I'll leave the legislation alone. I'll just touch on a couple more things. Uh, calendar wise, you know, we're into the 2022 session now that started at the beginning of January. Um, tomorrow is tomorrow the 18th. Um, that's the last day for bills to be introduced for the, for the current session. Um, as of a couple few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, there were only, um, you know, several hundreds of bills that had been introduced by the end of tomorrow, we're anticipating at least a, a couple few thousand that, that will be on the books for the current year to go through. Um, so we have a lot of um, the city employs contract lobbyists that, that really work with staff and, and we go through those bills and kind of identify what's relevant and important to the city that we may want to consider and, and position on. We work with our city council legislative subcommittee uh, that's been appointed as a standing committee of the city council, um, and they dive deep into those uh, those issues and, and recommend positions um, in accordance with our legislative platform. Uh, in May, we'll anticipate the governor's May revise of his 22-23 uh, budget. Uh, there's a significant um, budget surplus, as there was last year, uh, that the governor will be uh, allocating. I think I touched on that on the next slide briefly. Uh, May 27th is the House of Origin deadline, so bills that are introduced in 2022 need to be advanced out of committees and off the floor of their House of Origin by the end of May, um, and then uh, the budget has to be signed by the governor by June 30th. Um, looking into the, the current session and, and moving forward, 
Um, you know, with redistricting uh, on the heels of the new census data, um, you're seeing new district maps being adopted across the state. And so um, the last list I saw was about 20 different legislators. There may be more by now that either have decided not to seek reelection or, um, you know, are just getting out of the game um, at this point. And so that's an interesting dynamic. Um, like I said, lots of bills have already been introduced, but, but more to come. Um, and then in terms of the budget process um, and the governor's budget proposal that's been um, outlined, they're anticipating a $25 billion surplus in terms of discretionary income revenue to the city um, and, or to the state rather. Um, and so there are a variety of proposals to, to distribute that. And some of the major themes that um, were highlighted obviously touching on COVID response and recovery, um, climate action and infrastructure investments, homelessness uh, programs and housing, and then kind of this recent trend that we're seeing of organized retail crime. Um, and so those are the things we're uh, tracking and, and monitoring in the current state budget. I think that's my last slide. So I'll stop sharing there. I hope I touched on things that you were hoping to hear about today. Um, and I'm happy to dive deeper or um, answer any questions you might have. I know we have a few questions that came up in the chat. If, if you wanna put your hand up, I'll uh, lead the question asking or call on you to organize that. Questions? Gary, you had a couple things in the chat. Did you wanna bring those up? Let's see. Sure. Let's see. I did. I, I noted that uh, I had a couple of questions. The, Hi, Gary. Hi, Jason. Good to see <laughs> nice you again. To see you. Yeah, likewise. The, the uh, change in, there's an implication that a single family zoning is for one house. And really, because of the secondary dwelling unit, law that was passed, it's really for two units, because each one can accommodate, I'll just go with one secondary dwelling unit, even though the law allows for maybe more than one. So when we're going from uh, one single family house plus a secondary dwelling unit to, let's say two units, if they split the lot into two, or if they built a duplex, um, according to Carl Smith's code, you wouldn't be able to do a secondary dwelling unit for a multi-unit housing, it's only for single family houses. So you're really going from two to four and not one to four. And I get this implication that we're like, it's that many more units from one to four, not from two to four. Does that make sense? Maybe that was too yeah, I, I think so. It's complicated for sure. And there are um, various conditions and, and scenarios where you can wind up with, with different configurations. Um, I, you know, and I didn't touch on every provision of, of SB9 and, and what's in, implied there. There are um, certain residency uh, requirements, you know, um, owners have to live in the pro on the property for a certain duration of time. There has to be an affidavit that's signed that says uh, they'll be occupying one of the units. I think it can't be used for short-term rate rentals. Um, but yeah, just the math on trying to figure out what really could be built here. Um, you know, prior law was adopted that said with a, with a single family home, um, you know, in most cases, you can add an accessory dwelling unit. Um, in most cases, you can add a junior accessory dwelling unit. So, you know, even without SB9, theoretically, you could end up with three units on a single family zoned property. Um, now with SB9, yes, you can imagine a couple different scenarios. If you don't do a lot split, um, where once you could have, um, um, I don't know that it changes it significantly in terms of, I can't remember exactly how the math works out, but yes, you can, you can add a secondary unit 
Um, and then I think you can combine that with ADU and junior ADU kind of configurations. Um, in another scenario with the lot split, um, I think you lose access to the ADU provisions, but uh, you could have two units on each. And now each of those lots can be conveyed or sold um, independently. Um, and so, yes, there, there remains a, a variety of kind of different scenarios that can, can result on single family neighborhoods. Has anyone resolved that, let's say my neighborhood is zoned R1 10,000. So 10,000 square feet minimum per lot. So just because the law says you could split something into two, does that relieve it of still having to have 10,000 square feet per lot? Yes, and it, su and it supersedes, I think, in many cases, um, local laws that, that would provide limitations on that. And so, um, again, it's been a little while now since I've looked at the details of it. I, I, I'm happy to provide a summary of, of, of the detailed bullet points of that law, but um, you know, suffice to say in, in most scenarios, it um, takes away you know, some minimum lot size requirements, open space requirements on parcels, um, parking requirements are severely limited um, in terms of what can be imposed there. And so you can, there's, there's um, no provisions related to um, infrastructure requirements, you know, sewer capacity, water capacity, things like that. And so from, from the city standpoint, you know, we were really concerned that it, um, you know, kind of opens the floodgates potentially on, on a lot of new um, development, a lot of new density in, in neighborhoods that weren't initially planned to accommodate that in, in a variety of ways from an infrastructure standpoint. So um, that said, you know, it, it's not a universal opposition. There are some cities across the state where they really welcome and embrace this and see it as a, a great way to um, accommodate new new development and new new population in their in their jurisdictions. And so um, one of our complaints that kind of stands as an overarching kind of issue is that, you know, state law tends to be a fairly blunt tool in, in many cases. And it, it doesn't allow when you're, when you're applying things across the board, it doesn't allow for um, the unique conditions that exist in, in cities. And so um, we're constantly kind of asking for um, some consideration that would allow us to apply some discretion and, and recognize that, you know, the city like I kind of led with, you know, our general plan and all the work that's gone into our growth management plan to respond to the unique conditions and plan for the unique conditions that exist here in Carlsbad. Um, you know, we would like to see things built into state law that that leave some of that to the folks that know the community best and where to place density and, and where to accommodate density and, um, you know, bills like SB9 don't really account for that. I have one other question. I've been watching the village in particular and the rest and the extra units being built, the village having increased density in it uh, as a state required to accommodate more housing units to allow for more affordable housing to be built. And I'm watching the units that are built and they're definitely not affordable housing units. They do fulfill the minimum, you know, 15% or the, uh, the add, inclusion, yeah. The, yeah, the inclusionary units as extra units, but having that density, I don't see any evidence that that resulted in medium priced <laughs> or anything affordable. And affordable isn't, you know, two hundred thousand dollar house or something like that. It's let's say a five hundred thousand dollar house instead of a million dollar million dollar house. So, mm -hmm. is there any evidence that just increasing the density? Uh, actually results in, uh, because as, a, as you increase the density and the land is used up in more expensive units, there's less land available to actually have some affordable housing units. And yeah, there's more politics also to, because they wind up being placed in fewer and fewer areas and you need more of them. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, 
formula that applies differently in different jurisdictions and for sure and you know probably better than anybody you know being a coastal community with high land values um, that doesn't necessarily and being an attractive place to to live really um, it doesn't directly translate necessarily to affordability adding density uh, that said it is the state standard right and so again going back to the city's responsibility we have to plan for that and as long as we plan at the densities that they dictate we're deemed to be compliant with the requirements. Um, oftentimes when, you know, and almost universally, when we're seeing developers come in to actually do significant affordable housing development, it requires, you know, access to subsidized lending or, you know, otherwise some, um, you know, public subsidy to, to really make that happen. Um, but, you know, it kind of goes to that, point in terms of our um, housing element and the requirement for the 30% buffer in, in the planning that we include there, um, recognizing that market conditions don't mean necessarily that, you know, planning and developing projects that comply with the density requirements are going to actually deliver on the affordability side of that. So, um, no, I think that's a, that's a great point and it's, it's valid and it's, um, yeah, it touches on one of the flaws maybe in the in the theory behind it. Uh, Mary, you have a question or comment? I do. Jason, thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, hearing your history, the chronology of this. My question goes to process, and that is, I've, I've read uh, about the um, your your regs and code on ADUs and junior ADUs and sort <clears> of the processes that somebody who wants to do that. Um, whether they do or do not need to consult with, you know, the fire department, water department, and so on. Mm -hmm. How do you see um, in implementing SB9, do you imagine that there, there's sort of a similar process if it's kind of left to the homeowner to do that or this ministerial approval that you all will need to do? Is that where the city will get engaged to say, wait a minute, we, we want to do a, whether it's a wildfire interface you know, property or what? I mean, how do you envision the process changing for the city in doing SB9 compared to what you've been doing with the ADUs? Hmm, that's a good question there. And and it's a little bit out of my area of expertise, right? I would I would leave that better to the folks in our community development department to, to talk you through the specifics of it. Um, but yeah, the, the best thing, if, if you're really interested in, in understanding that in a detailed way, online, we do have a couple um, bulletins that have been produced by our community development department that really walk you through the process. And if you look at the one on ADU, it sounds like maybe you did. It's, it's very complicated, right? There's a lot of like, choose your own adventure, kind of if this, then that, and you gotta go here and you gotta go there. So it's, it's a little bit beyond kind of just a, a simple answer. Um, and I think the same would apply relative to SB9 application if, if you start thinking about, um, but, but really the, the, the city's hands are, are tied to some degree by the law in terms of um, the timelines and the level of review and what the standards are for um, approving or denying an, an application like that. And so um, best place to, to go for kind of really a more detailed understanding of what that process looks like is our community development department. So I, I just have a question to clarify. So I know the bill has passed and it has taken effect. So theoretically a homeowner can start this process to Mary's question and go through whatever that process is that you're discussing right now and start the process of splitting the lot and working through that. Okay. Yeah. And I and I do see there's a question about the 30% buffer. I'm sorry, I wasn't more okay. clear about that. Um, that just goes to, um, as the city, um, recall, I was talking about the regional housing needs assessment and allocation that comes to each jurisdiction. Um, so just for round numbers, let's say, um, if the city was uh, assigned, city of Carlsbad was assigned to accommodate 3,000 new units over the current housing cycle, the next eight years, let's say, um, 
our housing element ultimately has to be approved by a state agency, certified by a state agency, um, housing and community development. And in order to do that and accommodate for the things that like Gary was talking about, where you know you can plan for this level of affordability or density, but when the projects uh, applications come in, they might not meet those targets that you planned for. And so as those projects are approved and you know your actual development um, in your community either meets the plan or doesn't, um, there's this provision for no net loss. You have to continue to plan for, in order for HCD to approve our plan on the front end, they recommend as a best practice that you build in an extra 30% of capacity for new housing development in your community, in your plan, acknowledging that the market uncertainty, you know, and activity that is, is free market-based will um, actually give you the possibility of meeting the uh, allocation that you've been assigned. So that's what the 30% buffer is. It's a, it's a planning uh, tool that just um, helps ensure that communities have real capacity um, in the real world kind of application of all of this theory to accommodate the, the new development that, that we need to accommodate. Uh, Ronnie, question or comment? This is, uh, well, actually, I have a couple of questions. I'm a little confused about what, what's the role of SANDAG anymore in all this? What, what, I thought before some of this legislation went down, SANDAG determined how, how many units you were supposed to have in, in, in your particular city. And how do they determine that? By, by the acreage of the city or the, the kind of population that lives there? Um, yeah, but 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 does this new SB nine supersede anything that Sandag used to do? Yeah, so you know, I would just think of those as totally separate. Basically, SB nine has no relationship towards meeting your RENA numbers, um, and so um, it's simply a housing production bill. It just oh, okay. it doesn't have to do with with meeting your target. SANDAG is still the regional agency. Um, so the role basically is that the state does a forecast um, of your current, they look at your current population, they look at population growth, they look at um, economic activity in the region, they look at um, how many housing units you have currently existing, um, they look at um, income levels, you know, distributed across your city. They look at um, vacancy rates and vacant land that you have to accommodate, you know, new people in the city. They look at overcrowding, um, you know, household sizes and things like that. And at the end of the day, they come up with a projection over the next eight years, if you continue to grow at this certain rate and we plug in these various factors, you're going to have, you know, X number of people that you need to plan to house over that time frame at various affordability levels, and you know, as as I'm assuming many of you know, Sandag is um, a board that's comprised of representatives from all of the different cities and the county, um, and so there's like this haggling process that goes on. They come up with different criteria for, you know, the state handed down um, an allocation for the most recent cycle, and I've forget the number off the top of my head. I want to say it was like 170,000 roughly that needs to be accommodated across the county. And so then Sandag takes that number and they apply these different criteria. It could be transit, access to transit. It could be access to jobs. It could, you know, it's a variety of things that basically say, okay, city of San Diego, you take this many and Carlsbad, you take that many. And then we, you know, the board kind of goes through a process of coming to an agreement about, okay, we'll, we'll take 3,900 in Carlsbad and that's, that's kind of where we land it. And so, um, yes, they still play that role and, um, it's, it's totally separate from any of the provisions of SB9. Thank you. Just a bonus, bonus. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? No. All right. All right, Jason, thank you so much. That was very interesting. We really, I know I appreciated the background as well and 
That yeah. sounds like a lot of interesting things that the cities are really having to balance with all those different requirements. So we appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, thank you very much. And um, stay tuned if you're if you're interested in tracking legislation. Our um, city council legislative subcommittee meets monthly on the second Tuesday of the month, uh, 9 a.m. You can catch it on Zoom, and the link is there on the city's website. But um, you know we continue to stay engaged, and we have. Um, a great lobbying firm that really keeps us informed as well as our membership in the League of California Cities. You know, we really have um, a, a coalition of, of cities with similar interests that um, help us fight the good fight. So um, thank you all for having me. And thank you. Um, have please. a great, great day. Oh, Mary, yeah. did you have one other comment before Jason goes? I did. I was hoping to make a pitch. <laughs> uh, the League uh, here in North County, we're also joined by our I'll call it a sister league down in San Diego. It's a joint uh, activity. And so regionally we, we work on issues and we regionally are hosting a webinar next Wednesday. Um, we're trying to get the word out and we'll have a representative from Senator Atkins office and then um, the city of San Diego, city of Poway and city of Chula Vista uh, planning directors who are coming to talk about um, their um, challenges and uh, opportunities in implementing SB9 and SB10. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat a link to register for that. Um, but uh, we'd love to have you listen in and join us and uh, maybe uh, comment while you're there. So um, I know that they would love to hear some of the things you had to say today. Okay, well, thank you. Please, yeah, give me the details. And if, uh, if I can, I'll be there. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Sounds like an interesting conversation for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Have a good rest of the day. Thank okay, you, Jason. I, 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 Thank I don't you. see it in I don't see it in the chat yet. So, um, oh, there it is. Okay, I've got it now. Thank you all so much. Nice okay. talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.